Here's a question. Should pastors talk politics? Should they share their opinions on topics like abortion, gender identity, or even the southern border and the economy? Are there political topics that should be off limits in church? Well, our next guest is the pastor uh, the New York Times has been warning you about. He loves God. He loves his country, which means he's got to be some sort of Christian nationalist extremist. I think you're going to find this man fascinating. Uh, and we talk about Christian nationalism and what it really is. Um, this is this is one of my favorite conversations we've had uh, so far this year. And I know it's only February, but uh, while America has become squeamish about bringing God into the public square, our next guest is telling God, come on in. The question is, do we still have a place for God in America? Or better question, does God still have a place for us? Welcome the lead pastor of Grace City Church, somebody I can't wait for you to meet, Pastor Josh McPherson. Before we get to our guest first, let me tell you about Preborn. Preborn um, network of clinics saw over 58,000 babies saved. Thanks to you who made this possible. To celebrate the precious babies and the life and the lives of the moms. Everybody's like, oh, they're sinners, what? whatever. They're moms. And that's the thing I like about preborn. They not only save the baby, they save the mom too and take care of her for weeks after. Let me tell you about one of the people that went to get an ultrasound and was planning on getting an abortion. Charlotte is her name. She was pregnant. She was seven weeks along. In the back of her mind, she thought abortion is the best solution. But then she went to preborn and she saw her beautiful baby on an ultrasound and heard the heartbeat and she chose life. She'd like to thank you for making that possible. If you would like to help moms who are in crisis and babies to live, don't think there's a better way to do it than uh, going um, to preborn.com slash Glenn and donate. 28 bucks buys one of those ultrasounds. You can hit di- uh, pound 250 uh, and say the keyword baby, and you can also donate there or just go online again to preborn.com slash Glenn. Josh, welcome. Thank How you. are you? Thanks for coming in. I know you traveled a long way to be here. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, good. Um, I, I saw a clip of yours, maybe over the holidays, and uh, kind of went down a rabbit hole. And you are very outspoken uh, and shoot from the hip, call them as you see it. And uh, you, you, I think your excoriation needs to be heard by the church and Mm. us Christians who are kind of fat and lazy. (laughs) Let's go. So what, so what is your, your main message to people? Um, you're just a, I mean, you're a regular pastor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm even doing here. So, the, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, my, uh, I scrolled through the list of some of your podcast guests, and I, I, uh, I was looking for um, backwater blue collar hick from the stick pastors, and I didn't see any. <laughs> so, so I feel like I feel like one is not like the other here. So, well, but if you if that's what you describe yourself, then you would be a first. But um, I think. Uh, this podcast, we try to look for uh, thinkers. Yeah. We look for people who are saying things that should be said, need yeah. to be said, yeah. even if I don't like them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the country is in real trouble. And it's, yeah. it's in my opinion, it's not a political problem. It's yeah. a deep, deep spiritual yeah. problem. Amen. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I uh, when I think about the, um, the state of the kingdom of God in the church. There, there's two ways I think about it. The first is on one hand, and theologians would break it up in different categories. There's the visible church and the invisible church. And so the invisible church, the true church, the people filled with the spirit of God, they're doing great. They're kicking tail and taking names. They're loving people, caring for people, being generous and kind and patient and sweet. The kingdom of God is advancing steadily forward, which mm-hmm. is exciting. So mm-hmm. it's not a question of whether or not our team's going to win. It's a question of if we're, we're going to be on the team when they do. And so... Uh, what do you mean by that? 
um, Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he has a plan and he's advancing all of history toward his intended purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, he will get his glory. His plan will come about. And so it's, it's every not, knee shall bow and every everyone absolutely, will know. Absolutely. So it's not as if we're in a game wondering how of the outcome is. <laughs> right. How is this going to go? And so in, in one sense, uh, I have I'm a man full of hope uh, because we know the end of the, uh, the, the outcome yeah. of the end of the game. And then there's there's the other side where we look at the visible church. And there is reason for concern and cause for concern. And so you ask me, um, what's my message or, or why do I shoot from the hip? I, I think about it um, when, I, when I come to cultural issues, political issues, and, and how to address them as a man of God. I never wake up thinking, what will pe- people think if I say this? Right. I never wake up thinking, how will this play with my, with my audience or, or my, my church? I never wake up thinking, will this build my brand or put my brand at risk? I, I wake up worried and concerned about one thing. And that's offending the holy God. So I don't wake up thinking about, are people going to like what I say? I wake up worried about losing the anointing of God. Because if I have the anointing and favor and blessing of God and no one's favor, I'll be fine. Mm. But if, if I... If and that I, doesn't mean successful. N- no, not at all. I mean, but, successful in his work, but not necessarily worldly success. Yeah, my, my goal isn't to be successful. My goal is to be faithful. And, um, and so I was even reading this morning in Isaiah. And you have this incredible picture where Isaiah is talking about what are those who call evil good and good evil? Mm-hmm. What are those who take what is sweet and make it bitter? And he's talking about um, a country and a nation and a culture that's turned everything upside down. So take marriage. Marriage, God designed as sweet. And now we have this, this contorted, counterfeit, perversion, re- redefinition of it. Now we've taken what's sweet and we've made it bitter. And God says, woe to the nation that does that. And, uh, and then later in the text, um, God opens up a vision of himself to Isaiah. And he says, I, I saw the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is, and is to come. And in the presence of God and with a vision of Jesus seated on the throne, Isaiah responds, woe is me. I am undone for I'm a man of unclean lips and I, mi- I live among a people of unclean lips. And he realizes in the light of a vision of Christ, he is totally exposed as the sinner and fraud that he is. And so I think if a pastor is living in light of that vision, Mm. um, the first message isn't, hey, all you idiots, get your act together. The message is, woe to all of us. Repent, believe, follow Jesus. So later in the text, you know, the the angel touches his lips with the hot coal and and he's purified in a sense symbolically. And um, the Lord says, uh, who am I going to send? And he says, here I am, send me. And so when I get up in the pulpit um, every Sunday, uh, in a sense, it's a response to what I see in me in, in terms of brokenness and sin and the need for repentance and faith in Christ and the need for rescue and redemption. And it's need I see in the culture. And so um, it might look like I shoot from the hip, but it, it's, uh, it's intentionally prayed over, studied, prepared. And my, my concern with today, and I don't want to be a critic of the church because it's Jesus' bride, and so be careful, but my concern with the American church is that um, pastors are being too calculated, and they're being too measured, and they're being too nuanced, and we are not in such a days that need, that we don't need nuance. We need, we need the gospel set forth plainly. We've been nuanced to death. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to get a T-shirt during COVID, like, 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 stop being reasonable, stop being measured. They're, they're ruining people's lives. They're shutting down businesses. They're destroying children's education. They're destroying mental health. I mean, all these implications of just radical, crazy uh, tyranny. Tell me, what, tell me what you did as a, as a pastor at, during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go there yeah we're gonna go there oh we got more than this to go to uh we sued the governor of our state um that's the punchline i guess um march 15th like everybody else uh the world shut down and we went from gathering uh, in a rented facility to online and i i looked into the camera and i told my church in these days and i quoted romans 13 the most explicit extru- instructions that paul gives us and how to relate to the government i said it's our job to believe the best to honor the king and to make his job a blessing to rule us and lead us in times of crisis and then about 6 weeks later we sued the governor and i was working from the same premise that paul gives us in romans 13 um 
And uh, what led up to it was, at least in my state, and I talk with pastors all over the country, mm-hmm. and it's super weird because because pastors in the South, more red states, they're like, COVID, COVID, COVID. Oh yeah, it was like two or three weeks. I was like, <laughs> yeah. we were in a state of emergency. A governor declared emergency. Because you're in Washington in State. In Washington State God for over you. two years. Mm-hmm. It was a gross misdemeanor to leave my house for months for anything that was deemed by the governor as essential. Wow. So, and of course, religion is not essential. Absolutely not essential. Yeah. Um, and and I, th- I think probably the, the turning point for me was um, you're trying to figure it out. You're, you're, you're like, like, this is crazy. They're telling us two weeks to flatten the curve and it's been six weeks. This is nuts. The hospital is going to be overrun. They're not overrun. I, I have people I trust in my church at hospitals saying, uh, you know the whole thing, we're, we're testing for positive cases, and if we test under 80 positive cases a week, they'll let us out of phase one, which was total lockdown. He said, we had a guy come in last week with COVID. I test him five times a day, hoping to get a, 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 a negative uh, test, and the second I do, we can let him go. My manager came to me and said, you're miscounting. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, he goes you only have one positive case here. And he says, that's because there's one person. How many times have you tested him? He's like, 36 times in the last four days. That's 36 positive cases. Oh my gosh. And so these are men I trust. These are men I, 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 I had a dear friend who runs an ambulance business and, and a dear, dear trusted friend. His father was in politics all his life. He said, uh, so we brought a guy in today from a head-on car collision, 36, and uh, they charted as a COVID death. Because we were told from a press conference in the White House that they're going to chart died from COVID and with COVID as, as the same thing. And so that's when we started realizing, like, this, this is not maybe what it seems to be. This maybe isn't like the Black Plague, that, like we're being told. And so, of course, we're not meeting still. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and um, Thomas Sowell put it this way. He, he, he said, liberals look at the problem solution. Conservatives look problem trade-offs. And so we were looking at it from a like, okay, yes, this is potentially dangerous, but let's look at the economical ramifications, the mental ramifications, the emotional ramifications, the educational ramifications, the spiritual ramifications. Let's look at all these, these things. And, and it was which like- Which is worse. Which is worse. And it was like an elephant being afraid of, of a cat. Mm-hmm. And so to avoid the cat, he jumped off a cliff and died. Mm-hmm. And so um, we began looking at what we could do as a church to help our community. So I was sitting at my dining room table um, with my family and just, we, we're kind of in it, right? And, and, and cause you're like, you're trying to figure out, cause every week press conference from the governor, um, and it's just scare tactics and fear mongering and, and shelter and like shelter in place is the language that's being used. And, um, we're building a church, a building in the process. Our construction project gets shut down. $15 million dollar construction project dead in the water. And across the way is a government construction project fired yes. on all fours. Mm-hmm. And we're like, well, that's not cool. And then it's like all local small businesses closed down, but Costco is having record yep. quarters. Mm-hmm. Amazon, because all the brick and mortar stores are closed down because Jeff Bezos is like, this is dangerous, skyrocketing. I, I've built almost 100,000 square feet of commercial square footage in the last five years. We've had to change our roof plan three times because Amazon is building 20 million square feet of new, uh, 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 um, what do you call it? You know, holding centers for mm-hmm. their deliver, delivery centers in Where the last three years. It's crazy. So we're sitting at our dining room table <coughs> and, uh, and uh, we're sitting at our dining room table and with my kids, um, four children who are remarkable, the discerning, the, the spirit of God fills them all. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they started asking me questions and it wasn't coordinated. Mm-hmm. I don't think, <laughs> uh, the first question was, Hey dad, uh, is it true? And they would name someone in our church that they can't open their small business. I said, yeah. Is it true? And then they named someone else, so-and-so can't go to work and do their job. Yeah. Is it true that they're still having to pay taxes even though they can't go to work? I said, yeah. And then my, my daughter who was born with spina bifida, she's in a wheelchair. Um, she's very passionate about um, this issue of life mm-hmm. because in utero we had a genetic counselor try to convince us that my daughter would be a burden on the world mm. rather than a blessing and did everything mm. they could to talk us into aborting her and that's the only time i've heard my wife cuss <laughs> 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 and so my daughter knows that 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 um she's not a burden she's a blessing mm-hmm. and she said is it true dad that even though these local businesses are closed and kids can't go to school, that the abortion clinics are still open. 
I said, yeah. Is it true that, that the alcohol stores are still open? I said, yeah. Is it true that the casinos are still open? I said, yes. And then just kind of this, this, this sweet, precious moment you probably have with your kids at times. Mm-hmm. They just kind of looked around and they looked at me and they said, <laughs> I didn't mean to get emotional. I didn't think we were going to talk about this. They said, uh, well, what are we going to do about it? And uh, I didn't have an answer. And I said, um, well, ask me tomorrow and I'll have one. And so I began calling um, elected officials, mayors, sheriffs, state representatives, um, 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 county commissioners, going like, hey, what's going on? What do we do? And uh, to the man, to the woman, Olympia's closed. No one's responding. Nobody's talking. They've shut it down. Because the danger that we saw was they centralized all of the authority, Glenn, in Olympia. Yep. They decimated local government, yes. which is what I think America is built on. The genius of America oh, yeah. is, is local government. It is bottom up. That's right. And so, and so when, when, when bureaucracy grows, everyone loses because bureaucracy is nameless, faceless powers behind the curtains that you can't get at with a vote, mm-hmm. telling you how to live apart from being held accountable to the standards they make everyone else live down to. Mm-hmm. And so when you have someone in power making rules for everyone else they don't have to live by, recipe for disaster. And so we're like, why are they telling us what to do in Chelan County when they're 400 miles away and have no clue what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And so um, to the man, everyone told me, we think the only way to get out of this is to sue the governor for illegally putting us into an emergency that only he determines when we get out of. Mm -hmm. So no legislators, legislature can meet like nothing. Meanwhile, they're shoving through crazy legislation Mm -hmm. regarding law enforcement, regarding public schools. I mean, like it, it, it was it was a political boon for uh, Governor Inslee in his ilk. And so, uh, so I said, what should we do? And they said, well, there's two options. You can sue him for religious freedom or you can sue him as a citizen. So our elders talked and prayed and we thought if, 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 if we play the religious freedom card so we can gather and meet, that would be a win and that, and that is good. But it won't be everybody else. But it won't help everyone else. And here's the thing, it, it, historically what people understand is that the church has always been um, the, the, the best of friends um, for the benevolent government mm-hmm. and the worst of enemies to the tyrannical dictator. Mm-hmm. And that's by design and, and by jurisdictions. And so I, I explained to our church, the jurisdictional lanes of God's design, the jurisdiction of the individual is, I, I have the gift from God of making autonomous decisions that have real consequences in time and space history. And that's, that's, the, that's the, um, the honor that God gives you and mm-hmm. I a, 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 as free will uh, a, a beings. Then there's a jurisdiction of, of the family and they have both responsibility and authority as the cornerstone of society that's with, with the marriage of one man and one woman at the center of it, they have the responsibility and authority to um, raise, pr- shelter, protect, raise, and educate their children. And then you have the, the jurisdiction of the church, which is responsible for preaching the gospel and faithfully administering the sacraments. And then you have the jurisdiction of the government. And God has designed all those jurisdictions with certain roles and responsibilities and authorities to exercise and walk those things out. And when everyone runs in their lane, it's beautiful. The problem is we start mixing lanes and it's, and it's, it's a traffic jam and it's a cataclysmic car wreck. And so what, we, what I explained to our church was individuals are in, are in sports cars, families are in SUVs and minivans, churches are in party buses, and the government is in a massive 18 wheeler driven by one or two bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. And when the government begins to swerve out of their lane, it's the responsibility from the word of God and constitutionally, I believe, for the church to stay in their lane and honk their horn. Say, hey, 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 you stay over there. And when they do that, they're doing it as a friend of the government, Mm -hmm. not as a scoff law, Mm -hmm. but as a friend of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, we're grateful for the constitution. and, 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 And you realize that you're in your position of authority as, as one who's been put there by us mm-hmm. and by God. Mm-hmm. So you're in authority as one under authority and the rules of the game from the word of God and our constitution say you say over there. And every once in a while, the church might need to, to rub some paint. And so what I told our church was, if we hit the brakes and back off so as to not rub any paint, then there's nothing standing between the government and decimating the family and individual. And that's what we saw churches doing over and over and over again. We're gonna misinterpret Romans 13 as to honor God, we should do whatever the government says, even right. if it's devastating to ourselves, our churches and our communities, because that's what it means to honor God. And we had a very different conviction in relationship to that. 
And so the path we chose was to rather go at it from a point of citizens, because if we only had the right to meet as a church, that would be a step in the right direction, mm -hmm. but no one in my church can, can go back to their work. Right. And so we led, our elders and I, we led a, a team of 46, we called them the Noble 46 plaintiffs. And here's the crazy thing, Glenn, I, um, I talked to a constitutional attorney, Joel Ard, he's a wonderful Catholic brother, and super sharp, super intelligent. He gave me a download education on the Constitution. And, um, and, and uh, I hung up with him and I said, I think we need to sue the governor. We prayed about it, unified elder team. I sent out four texts. I said, we're thinking about suing the governor on civil, on civil grounds to break this, um, this hold of emergency powers to open our county, to go back to work. And I said, if you're interested, come to my house. And two hours later, there were 46 strangers I'd never met on my back wow. porch. Breaking wow. the law, eating apple pie. <laughs> these are the people that, Amer that makes America great. I'm right. not kidding. Like the unheard of, unseen, yeah. unsung heroes who get up every day and run their small business, mm -hmm. provide a product for a price. Um, so it was fun because all of these like legendary local, you know, um, like the windmill, you know, legendary steakhouse. Mm -hmm. Had a thousand steaks there, never met the mm -hmm. owner. He was on my back porch. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was just like, you on the windmill? Oh, I yeah. love your steaks. Thanks so right. much. And <laughs> so it was just a super fun Americana moment, you know, and it's kind of like this 1776, like, well, we're breaking the law. Isn't this awesome? Right. You know, and it's crazy. Oh, and it was wild. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's what, what bothered me so deeply, I think, Glenn, is like shame on the government, shame on bureaucratic officials drunk on their own power, um, that they would turn these law loving and law abiding citizens into criminals. Yes. And so I said, hey, glad to see you. I have no clue what we're doing. What if we sued the governor? And they're like, tell us more. And so I walked it through. I said, look, we're not scoff laws. Mm -hmm. So bro, while we're having this conversation, it's illegal to me as a church. And at the same time, Black Lives Matter is marching in the streets of Seattle, unmasked, shouting, screaming, and our governor is saying, there's patriots. Look how they exercise in their First Amendment rights. But you can't sing in church. It was, quote unquote, illegal to sing in church in my state for months. That's wild. But you could go to Seahawks game and cheer on Russell Wilson. So uh, we're meeting on the back porch here, and I go, look, um, we're not scofflaws here. We're, we're, we're going to play the game by the rules, which is always the conservative's weakness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we play by the rules, and, 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 and they don't sometimes. And they don't. So, so the, our rule says we go through the court system. They just give themselves power, declare mm -hmm. executive uh, powers, and then just make crap up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it was destabilizing our, our, our community, and this is what I learned from Joel Ard, is the reason third world countries don't have growing small businesses is because there's no consistency of rule of law. Exactly right. So I'm not gonna go buy property right. in, in, you know, in a place where I don't know the, the law of the jungle, who's in power next right. week. I, I can't, I'm not going to apply for a business license if I build my business and I'm not, the next week somebody can come in and say, you know what, your business license is no good because of this. That's right, that's right. So we had over a thousand LNI officers added to the payroll in three months and their sole job as a weaponized arm of the tyrannical government branch was to bully law-abiding citizens into obeying these crazy, like, like every press conference on a Friday, a new edict was passed down. You can do this, you can't do that. It was impossible to keep up right. with every, I think, and I'm gonna admit this number, but like, I wanna say like two or 3,000 edicts from on high, the, from, the, from yeah. the governor's office of things you couldn't, couldn't do and you'd be considered a, a, a lawbreaker if you if did you them. So all of a sudden now we're cheapening the rule of law because law enforcement is going, I'm not enforcing that. Yeah. I didn't sign up and put the badge on to shut mm -hmm. down small businesses. Mm -hmm. Like this is crazy. So it's just causing division and, and, and chaos. Interrupt me whenever you want. I can keep going I'm with just story. Right. No, just yeah. tell me, just tell me the, the end story. What happened? Did you? So we, we, we got together, we put the lawsuit together. The basis of the lawsuit that I love so much wasn't that we, we, we weren't suing on the basis of COVID. The COVID mm -hmm. isn't real. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it, it, let's, you're going for the constitution. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like we're we're fighting for the right of locally elected officials to do their job. Because their eyes are on the ground, they see what's going on, and if they can make decisions that that, mm -hmm. that causes the flourishing of the city, we'll support them. And if they make poor decisions, we'll we'll act as a representative democ democracy does and we'll vote them out, but we still have a say. When you take that away and centralize it in Olympia, we have no say. So the lawsuit was to break the emergency powers and to ask permission from the governor or to just 
be allowed to live our lives. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so we got right to the, the one, the, the one yard line and, um, the, the judge essentially told us if you can get confirmation from your local health district that they can handle this pandemic, I'll rule in your favor was basically kind of the legal code words that she was giving us. And I got, you got a picture of the optics. We have a volunteer pro bono attorney that's driving three hours to be at every hearing. They keep changing the dates of the hearing, the location of the hearing. They have four of their crack attorneys. So Inslee has the largest uh, yeah. attorney general office in the country. Mm -hmm four attorneys that we're paying the salaries of with our taxes <laughs> that we're asking for permission to go back to work so we can pay taxes to, <laughs> to fund their jobs and they're fighting against us and the judge who's in an Inslee appointee has COVID. Those are the optics. And it was this kind of David and Goliath moment. So uh, the day before the final trial, uh, she said, you know, hey, if, 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 if you have a, a letter uh, signed by the health, local health district guy, we're good to go. And um, he'd been with us the whole time. Now he's not answering phone calls, emails. Wow. Long story short, he totally weaseled. Uh, we, we, we found that he'd been talking with the, mm -hmm. the, the um, attorneys from Washington and kind of had a sweetheart deal going. So he weaseled and, 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 and wouldn't give us the authority. He was quoted in the paper the day before saying there is no pandemic. There is no threat in our valley. We can handle it. And the next day, he won't talk to us. We go back to the judge, say, he said this in the paper. She's like, that's not admissible in court. And I'm like, we don't know what to do. And she's like, I'm sorry. And so she ruled against us. And, um, so and that was it. This is a, this is a, real, a real problem. Uh, people are offered all kinds. I mean, the one thing I've, I've, I've learned, when your back is up against the wall yeah. and you're being uh you're standing up for what is right yeah everything you've ever wanted will be offered to you yeah uh and yep. it is so seductive yep. and it, well it's just me i don't i mean it's not gonna and we're yep. so many people are falling yep. for um these seductive yep. outs and nobody yep. is thinking about the constitution no one's yep. thinking about like, like you said, um, their responsibility yeah. as a citizen of another kingdom. Yeah. And we just flush them down. And I don't see our churches. They, they failed in COVID. Yeah. And I still, I mean, my church, I, I go and I'm like, is anyone talking about, let's say, the border? Yeah. I don't want somebody to tell me politically what to do, yeah. but I want to know what God would God would say something yeah. about yeah. the border, about yeah. COVID, uh, uh, about uh, spending so much money, yeah. about yeah. our treatment of of uh, illegal immigrants. Yeah. No one will put that. It they'll tell me what it meant in the first century. Yeah. Well, that's good. I yeah. want to know that. Yeah. But does that apply to today? Yeah. It's, it's like uh, the difference between uh, applied science right. and just theoretical science. I don't care about the theory. Yep. Show me how to apply this. Yep. How can it make my life better? Yep, yep. And one of the things that attracted me was you, you were, I mean, you went on, you went on quite a rant, mm -hmm. quite a rant. Um, and you were talking about the church needs to talk about yep. I, I don't. You might have even said politics, but you defined it different. You know, you, it's it's not politics. Yeah. But in today's world, everything is politics. Yeah. The, the the pastor has to think in terms of not left or right, but up and down, right? And so it's not left, it's not right. It's kingdom of light, kingdom of dark. So I never think in terms of is this going to play to the left or the right. I think in terms of will this please God or displease Him. And um, there there's an interesting reality. Um, Aaron Wren wrote an article. A, a year or two ago, and he, he, he kind of framed the current evangelical church in kind of three epochs of time. Now, I'm all cards on the table. I would consider myself an evangelical Christian, if there even is such a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. I think in large part, it might be argued evangelicalism is dead and over because it's been co-opted kind of mind virus woke craziness or like angry mega, like burn everything down. Um, but let's say that there is an evangelical Christian left. I would define that as, throw out some big words, like, I believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of scripture, verbal every word, plenary authoritative, inspired by God. The word is, is the inspired word of God and authoritative for all of life. And there's a key there, all of life, right? Um, I believe in the penal substitutionary atoning work of Jesus, 
penal, and it was he was punished. Substitutionary in my place, atonement to win something for me I couldn't do myself, the salvation from God's wrath, right? I believe that heaven is real, hot, and long. I believe that heaven is available and glorious and open to all who would accept the invitation of Jesus as their personal savior. Um, I believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the word of God, for the glory of God alone. And I believe Jesus is coming back to judge the quick and the dead and usher in for once and all the kingdom he inaugurated when he came in his first coming. So those are my cards. That's, that's my lane. That's mm-hmm. my team. Now, having said that, then, the, the three epochs of time Aaron Wren identified his article was positive world. He's like 1950 to, to, to 19, I think 94, he said. And in the positive world, it was culturally advantageous to be a Christian. Eisenhower adds under God mm-hmm. uh, into the um, Pledge. Pledge of Allegiance. Entertainment aligned with family values, you right. know, uh, Andy Griffith's show, I love Walt Disney. Walt, <laughs> Walt Disney himself, incredible right. genius, drawing so much um, material from the, right. the kingdom of God uh, uh, analogies. And, and then you have, uh, you know, birth control, sex revolution, the, the crazy 70s. And then what happened when all the, the, um, the hippies went off their acid trips, they went to academia. Yes. Right. And so things began shifting, but no one noticed it yet because it was... If you want to run for office, you got to be a Protestant Catholic Christian mm-hmm. or you got nothing. And then things shifted and he, he identifies it in 1994, entertainment turns. You have friends celebrating illicit sex and pornography and broken relationships. You have Will and Grace celebrating open homosexuality. You have all these things turning. And, and at that point, evangelical world moved from positive world to, to neutral world. People didn't hate you for being a Christian, but they didn't love you for being a Christian. They were just kind of indifferent. Mm-hmm. It wasn't under God anymore. It was like, eh, with or without, we don't care. And so there, there was a season of, of, of neutral world for the Christian where um, people didn't hate you, but they didn't love you. It was just kind of whatever. And then he identifies the 30 epoch of time starting in 2014, Ferguson, right? Uh, some major evangelical Christian voices canceled. And then the Obergefell ruling where it, w- it was codified into law by the Supreme Court that the Christian ethos and value in regards to the sexual ethic and definition of marriage was no longer relevant to us as a society. And he's like, at that moment, the tables turned and now we're in negative world reality. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not advantageous to identify as a Christian anymore. You're not going to get social points for it. You can say the same thing in negative world that would have got you cheered and supported and loved by your community in positive and neutral world that now gets you shot at. And if your highest value as a Christian or a leader is to be liked and to be nice, getting shot at is a weird experience, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. And so yeah. the missiological impulses of the leaders that, that, that grew up and were mentored and did ministry in the positive world, neutral world, no longer translate to a negative world. So the, the, the two things we talk about in the Bible, Glenn, is contending and contextualizing. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, I became all things to all men, that by all means I might win some. He's contextualizing. Mm-hmm. He's trying to take the, the heavenly message of the gospel and make it intelligible to men on earth, which is exactly what you're saying. Does mm-hmm. the Bible have anything to say about the clown show we're living in? Right. Right? Yeah. And then in Jude, the same Paul says, I exhort you, contend for the faith once and for all passed down to the saints. So there's this tension that a pastor feels. I have to contend for the contr- truth and I have to contextualize it in a way people understand. We are living in a time and day and age when the church, I believe, and this is Just my do. opinion, and, 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 mm-hmm. I, and I could be off, and I say this humbly as a man fails and broken and trying to... Gospel of Josh. Be, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Woe is me, a man of unclean right. lips. That's my starting yeah. place. Yeah. Okay. My concern for my brothers is that we are over-contextualizing and then are contending. That, that we're, we're using contextualization as an excuse to be quiet and to compromise. Give me an example. <clears throat> Romans 13 says we should obey the government and honor the government. And the government says we should be okay with all these things that are explicitly against the scripture. But what we don't want to rock the boat. We need to be nice. And if we say the things, people might leave our churches. So we're going to contextualize the gospel by not addressing it. To which I would say, wrong. Number one, People walked away from Jesus every day. More walked away than stayed. Oh, yeah. So don't try to have a a higher retention rate in your preaching than Jesus had in his ministry. Number two, it's all of Christ for all of life. If the word of God doesn't speak, 
there's not an atom in the universe that Jesus Christ doesn't declare mm-hmm. mine, which means the word of God is relevant and applicable to sex, money, power. Everything. Everything. Politics. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, like, like in, in many ways, I think you could take the word of God and, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a mainline theme you could tie through scriptures where like one of the key tensions that's driving the story is the people of God and tyrannical government. Moses, Egypt, Daniel, Babylon, Esther, Persia, Paul, Rome. They murdered Paul because they deemed him a threat to public health and safety. And so what I see pastors doing is they, 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 take, the, they take Romans 13 and then they go, I need to contextualize this, so we gotta obey the government. And what they miss is they disconnect the writing of Paul in the epistles from the life of Paul in the book of Acts and when you disconnect the writings of Paul from the life of Paul, you miss the message of Paul. So the same guy that said, honor the, the emperor, spent the last 10 chapters of Acts suing the government, calling them out, preaching the gospel, and they finally cut his head off. But isn't that, I mean, you can't obey the government if the government has become anti-biblical. Yeah, so you know? I, I agree 100%. So we, if we had time, I'd read through Romans 13. When Paul describes honoring the, gov- the, the, the governor of the king, he's assuming a righteous government. Correct. Because he, he says, they're, they're here for your good. Right. Stop there. What's good? He says, they're here to punish evil. Stop right there. Who gets to define evil? So the question the Christian has to ask is, by what standard right. is the government called to rule? The moral law of God. He says, they're here for your good. They're here to, and, and, and he, he spells out, ironically, in, in Romans 13, the limitations of government. They're here to punish evil and to reward good and to protect us from, I would say, incursion and outside invasion. Very, very limited lane. They're, for not, the, they're doing the opposite and they're not. They're punishing good. They're rewarding evil, mm-hmm. right? And so now we're back to Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. So at that point, what you have is an illegitimate government. And what the Christian has to say is, I'm here to honor the jurisdictions of God, but I'm not gonna submit to an evil government because I'm submitting to a higher authority. Correct. Because every government is still one under authority. And here's the, here's the, the, the thing I love, Glenn, and, 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 and Bible guys will get on me for this, but, but listen to these words. If I read Romans 13 and Paul says, you are to submit to the highest power in the land. Uh, and you should be the best citizen of a nation. Then my question is, to, to our church was, who's the highest law in the land? And many Christians answered, the governor. Which I said, no. And then they answered, the president. Which I said, no. no. It's the constitution that mm-hmm. represents that. So we're not under Roman law. We're as, so that, that, that's how I would contextualize. I would take Romans 13 and go, okay, Paul said to submit to the highest law of the land, which was the emperor. And when the emperor acted unjustly and in evil manners, Paul was like, no, 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 you don't get to do that. You're under God's authority too. And if we lose the definition of good and evil, you can't do your job. When I, when I take Roman surgery, I contextualize it and I say, I say the highest law of our land, thanks be to God, is the constitution, which I think in my very limited redneck, backwater, blue collar, <laughs> hick from the sticks mm, pastor's yeah, yeah, opinion, yeah is the greatest document in the English language apart from the, the Word of God. The, yeah. the, 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 the I believe song. it's American scripture. I mean, it was, it was the, the finger of God yeah. was, is all over the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, yep. and the Bill of Rights. Yep. So, it, so then people say, well, now, 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 you're, now you're, being, you're, you're making politics your idol. And like, that's all just psych-op smokescreen mm-hmm. to keep pastors quiet from speaking the truth in the face of evil. Mm-hmm. And so when, when pastors tell me that we need to be Switzerland, we need to be neutral, I'm like, all no. you get is when you're neutral in an evil uh, culture is a sore crotch. And then <laughs> people are confused because if there's silence in the pulpits, there'll be confusion in the streets, mm-hmm. right? If there's cowardice in the pulpits, there'll, there'll be evil in the streets. If there's an unwillingness to talk about the very thing that's kicking everyone else's butt, we're not being helpful. So Martin Luther said, I think it was Martin Luther, he, he, he said, if I believe all the tenets of, 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 of scripture and yet am unwilling to defend that which is being attacked, I'm not being faithful. He's pointing to C.S. Lewis's courage as, as the highest virtue because it's that which upholds all the virtues. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but, but back to the contextualization of Romans, I'll make this final point. I don't, I don't want to lose it. Um, oh. Think about these words, and they're just remarkable. Um, 
we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And everyone stops reading. But the next sentence, mm. that government shall be established to protect these rights. Established by men. And that those governments shall draw their just powers from mm. the consent of the governed which means I then have obligation, not just constitutionally, but biblically, because Paul said, obey the highest law in the land, (laughs) which for us is the Constitution. And the Constitution tells me that if government acts out in in an evil way, I have an obligation constitutionally, but more important, biblically, to say, no, 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 we do not consent. Because, bro, they only have as much power as we give them. Mm-hmm. And if they're acting out in an evil way, and, and this is what I say off to my church, um, we may not be able to stop the tide of evil from coming, but we can keep the tide of evil from changing us. And when Jesus comes back, I don't want him confused about where I stood in these muddy times in relationship mm-hmm. to his truth. And so if for no other reason, to make sure that Jesus knew where I stood in these issues, I'm going to verbalize it. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to proclaim it. And if I could say anything to my my, my brothers in the pulpits of America today, which that's a pretty big statement, but as I'm learning to do, brothers, be bold, be courageous, be brokenhearted, walk in humility, walk in love, walk in the power of the spirit. Don't lose your spine. Don't turn over your voice. Open the word of God and show your people the radical application of God's word to every corner of their life. Set forth the truth plainly. Don't take things that are simple in the Word of God and make them overly sophisticated. Don't take things that are clear in the Word of God and make them muddy. Don't make the people think that God does not speak to the moment we're in as a culture because He does. Don't get caught up in partisan politics. Don't try to make the Word of God palatable. Endeavor to make the Word of God intelligible and plain, because that's what's going to help Glenn Beck. Back with Josh in just a second. First, let me tell you, sometimes the solutions we seek to fix a problem are really easy. When you're living with pain, nothing is easy, nothing. Um, And you start to think, I'm never going to feel better. I live with terrible pain in my hands, um, and I searched up and down, left and right, for anything that would make it stop. Uh, No matter what I tried, it never helped. The only solution I found, something that actually helped break the back of this awful cycle, Uh, was Relief Factor. My good wife, Tanya, told me, I'm not going to listen to you. Uh, I mean, that's that's not exactly the way she sounds. She sounds more like, I'm not going to listen to you, Graham, about it unless you try everything. Swear to you, that's exactly how she sounds. Uh, So I listened to my good wife, and I took the daily supplement. Helps your body uh, fight that pain by fighting inflammation. 100% drug-free. I didn't think it worked. It did. It did. I thought, there's no way this is going to work. You got it, Eh. relieffactor.com relieffactor.com try it now comes with a uh, feel better or your money back guarantee 1995 try it for three weeks relieffactor.com well i have to tell you you said to me i don't even know why i'm here i mean have you been listening to yourself (laughs) there are very few people in your position that are even saying this this plainly this this clearly we are uh entering a time where um, we have the freedom of religion. Yes. But we are losing our freedom of religion to freedom of worship. Yes. Tell me the difference. Um, freedom of worship was pushed by um, one of the presidential candidates a few elections ago. Mm. And it's, um, it's, it's a psych out smokescreen to, to silence and contain the church. So this doctrine of containment is, is uh, it's okay to do your thing as long as you do it in the building. Mm-hmm. But then don't bring it out here. It, it, just this week in London, um, people were, um, they tried to arrest them. Thank goodness um, it didn't happen. But they were told they could not sing hymns outside of their church. Yeah. They were out front. Yeah. And the police came and said, you guys got to go back in church. You're yep. not allowed to sing yep. those songs yep. outside of the church. Yep. That's freedom of worship. That's right. That's right. Freedom of religion is I have the freedom to practice my religion in the public square. And, and it goes further than this. You know, there are certain things 
you know, that I cannot change yeah. because I deeply believe them. Yes. You know, so, so, you just said it's very unpopular now to yeah. be a Christian. Yeah. Well, I am a Christian. Yeah. And, and it is unpopular. Yeah. And I could make a lot more money if yeah. I had gone the other side. Yeah. I don't because I believe these things. Yeah. So when they tell me you have to go along, keep that in the church, I yep. can't. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm not who yep. I am. Yep. I'm living a lie that will tear me apart. Yep. Because then yep. I have to reject everything I believe is true. That's right. Yeah. Paul said Galatians 1.10, if I was living for the approval of man, I could no longer be a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so um, whether it, it's, it's, a, it's a confliction in philosophy or a, uh, or a crisis of nerve. Like I, I, I've had pastors call me and tell me, I wish I lived where you live so I could say what you say. Oh my gosh. And I, and I think to myself, you're in Washington state. Yeah, bro. Look around. <laughs> it's very sporty up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get shot at, blogged about, lied about, smeared. I mean, it's the craziest things get said about me and, and, and the internet and COVID leveled the playing field. It used to be there was the Bible Belt that was nice and the Northwest that was crazy. And then some small rural towns that are like, like Americana, that's all gone. There is no small town America, the internet and all of the things that comes with it, all the problems, all the addictions are everywhere. COVID took, you know, progressive minds that had gathered at the urban centers, stepped on it like a boot, all the rats scattered off the ship, and now they're in small town rural America voting the way they voted, taking the thing, they're running from places that they destroyed with, 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 their, with their politics. And here's the thing, <clears throat> Politics matter because it affects real people. See this? Now you're just starting. It affects real it. people. And so it's like, it's like, no, no. And, and it's like, like call it politics, call, call it what you want. But when you say, oh, you're, the, you're, 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 you're becoming a voice for, for, the, for, for the, the radical right. You're playing into their hands. Ah! There are people on the left and on the right who, if they die apart from Jesus, will spend eternity in hell. I'm an up and down heaven, hell guy. So let's talk about Jesus. And Jesus is God's word speaks to all of this. So, so, so the move of, of the progressive left is to take moral issues and frame them as political. So let me say this, abortion is not political, it's moral. So-called gay marriage and the redefinition of marriage is not political, it's moral. This whole transgender, LBT, GV2, alphabet soup <laughs> garbage where we're, where we're mutilating children as a step towards mental health is immoral. You go down the line, right? And so it's, it's like they're in our lane now because mm -hmm. God's word has things to say to that. And if in framing it as a political issue, we say, well, I can't be political. I just, we got, we got a man of God. We're voluntarily laying down our sword and we're voluntarily shutting our voice when God says, speak. So rather than being prophets of God in a day of darkness and chaos, we've, we've become those who are with their silence, giving permission. And I would say even participating in the lie. You know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when mm. he was being exiled from Russia, right? Live not. Uh, what does he say? Live not by lies. Live not by lies. He writes his last essay and he mm -hmm. says, you may feel downtrodden and beaten. You may feel oppressed, outnumbered, outmanned, overwhelmed, but you are not victims. You may not have guns and tanks and ammunition, but you have your voice. And what he told them was, they can put you in prison, they can put you in chains, but only you can shut your mouth. So live not by lies. Here's and, the here's the problem with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, America has not exercised its religious muscle muscle for a long time. Yeah, maybe a hundred years, and it's just gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. Yeah, we don't have to be. We. I remember I read Immanuel Kant uh, back in '95, yeah. and this stuck with me yeah. because it was so odd yeah. to me. I thought, "What kind of world do you live in?" Right. He said, "There are many things that I believe that I shall never say, but I shall never say the things I do not believe." Mm. Okay. Yep. And I thought, "What kind of world do you live in where yeah. you where you say that?" Yep. And it stuck with me. Yeah. It's this world. Yeah. It's this world. Yep. And no one has the, we are all so spiritually weak. Yeah. Um, and even in good times, yeah. um, people don't want to, look, they don't, it comes even at school. You want to be with the cool kids. You don't yeah. want to be at your table. That's right. And you'll sell that table out yeah. in a heartbeat to yeah. be at that table. Yeah. How do you give people the courage 
when they're when everything in them is sit down, shut up, just be cool, just yeah. be cool. Yeah, um, live in light of the fear of God. Mm. And that sounds cheesy and cliche and, and, and such a pastor um, cop out, but the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. And if I wake up more worried about what people say about me than what God thinks about me, I'm forfeiting the anointing and favor and blessing of God, and I'm dead in the water anyways. And here's the thing is pastors say, well, if I say that, it'll be harsh and people will leave. I say, no, no, actually what people are looking for is the truth. They're starved for the truth. Stop voluntarily silencing yourself. And again, I take it back to not right or left, but up and down. God's given us a message and people need to hear the goodness of the gospel is that all of this is gonna burn up and be destroyed. And, and, and part of it is, is it's exciting to be alive right now because God has always done his best work in the darkest of times. Mm-hmm. I, I truly believe that we are oh, on the brink too. of an ap- absolute supernatural breakthrough where Jesus is like, I'm gonna come down. In Joshua chapter five, Moses has died. He's passed on his mantle to Joshua. And he says to Joshua, and this is the word of God. He says, uh, God says, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn, this is funny, to the right or Mm. to the left. Then you will be blessed. People have to wake up and go, um, do I want the blessing of man or the blessing of God? Mm -hmm. Do I want the approval of man or the approval of God? Mm -hmm. Do I want want to live in in fear of being canceled by man or do I want to live in fear of being canceled by God? And as a man who speaks for God, uh, from the word of God, I'm terrified of, of, misstepping or, or, or silencing or softening what, what he would say. So Joshua chapter five. You and I have a lot in common. Yeah. I, I may not be speaking on behalf of God yeah. in, in, in your way, but we all are. Yeah. And when you've actually received his grace yeah. and you know what it was like before his yeah. grace, I'm terrified of, especially now, as That's things right. get darker, yeah. because even the very elect will be misled. Yeah. There are, there's clear black and white, and then there are things that you're like, wait a minute, well, wait. Yeah. And you just have to stay so close to the Spirit. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's well, terrifying. It, the more we say no to the Spirit of God, the less He speaks. Mm-hmm. We're grieving the Spirit of God. So I believe that, that we, are, we are to live our lives according to, the, to the, the verbally inspired, authoritative Word of God, and then the Spirit of God speaks to us in our conscience. And every time we say no, or we violate our conscience, we're just turning the dimmer switch down in the voice of God. And, and what I'm terrified of is turning it down so I don't hear it anymore, mm. right? And, and I think God has been, is doing, is gonna continue to do a great work in your life, Glenn, I believe all my heart, as you're pursuing truth. What is true? Not what does man say, not what are those social religious constructs, what does the word of God say in relationship to my sin? and his holy savior and how I'm going to do business with God, the judge at the end. Like that's all we care about, right? Because if we get it right, if, if we live comfortable lives in the short term, like, like let's take social justice. If we, if we feed people, this is a you know, horn's nest to kick. If, if we meet people's temporal needs and don't meet their eternal needs, we have done them no service. We need cosmic justice to replace mm-hmm. social justice or else nothing else will work. But back to Joshua 5, what I love is this, and this is what, one of my life verses was just buried in the text. No one even thinks about Moses has handed it off to Josh and he has said, don't turn to the right to the left. Why would he tell Josh to be strong and courageous unless it was going to be difficult and terrifying to be faithful, right? Because anointing follows courageous obedience, not cowardly appeasement. And so if I may quote Yoda, yeah. I'm not afraid. You will be. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly right. And, and that's where I, th- I think um, leadership is pain tolerance. It is. Leadership is pain tolerance. And so your influence will only go so far as, as the pain you're, you're able to tolerate. And so, um, the, and, and God by his, his spirit can increase our pain tolerance threshold to the point where we actually don't fear it. We embrace it. Not, not in some misogynistic, like yeah, sick yeah, way, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but to say with Paul, Hey, throw me in prison. I'll just write songs and letters mm-hmm. to the church. Hey, murder me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And they're like, crap, we can't the, stop the, this guy. The people, they, what is it, six that just are facing 10 years in prison because they just stood at an abortion clinic. They weren't, 
I, I don't know. I, I didn't hear about Oh, that. you didn't hear this? Yeah, no. Oh, in Nashville, a jury just uh, convicted them of the FACE Act they, and because of the games the government is playing. Yeah. It's gone from like six months penalty to oh, wow. 10 plus years. Wow. I just had one of them on my show and uh, he was like, hey, we're with Christ. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You win some, you yeah. lose some. In the end, yeah. we win. Yep. And they're facing 10 years in prison. And wow. that's the kind of Christian I want to be yeah. to where it doesn't matter where you are or yeah. your circumstance. You are yeah. so aligned with him. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, dude, as long as I got him, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a... Um, doesn't mean it's not scary at times, I'm sure, but... No, but it can become exhilarating. Yeah. Be, because God's power f- flows to those who need it. And when we take the safe road of appeasement or the safe road of silence... Um, or the safe road of softening the message, God's power doesn't go there because yeah. it's not needed. So I got to get this Joshua 5 text out. It's my favorite, right, and then you can move on, talk about something else. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua has the mantle of leadership. He's leading the people of Israel into the promised land, which I tell my church is AKA battleground, because God does this mighty work. Mm-hmm. He, 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 um, he, halt, he halts the Jordan River. Mm-hmm. Israel crosses the Jordan River. Now they're in the promised land. They still got a lot of work to do because it's full of, of, of enemies and rebels of God. And so, first of all, it took a miracle to get the Israelites even onto the battlefield. And the same is true of us. It takes a miracle of salvation to break through our hard, stubborn, sinful by nature and choice to God, wake us up to the good news of the gospel, the glory of Jesus, the Lordship of Christ, that we should lay ourselves down for him in repentance and faith. Gets on in, uh, in the promised land and the first thing they see is Jericho. And it's like, well, crap. There's the bad guys. Like, we're in the promised land now. Like, how's this going to go? But the, the perspective from my church, I say, you got to flip it around. The story isn't, what's God doing leading us here? There's the bad guys. The story is Jericho is looking down from the walls of, the, of, of their encampment. And, they, and, and, and they're like, where, where are the Israelites? They're on the other side of the river. It's at harvest time. It's flooding. There's no way they can get across. We're tactically sound. We're good. Next morning, where's the Israelites? Oh, crap, they're on our side of the river. <laughs> How'd that happen? Uh, sir, the water just stopped flowing. I think that Jericho knew they were defeated before the Israelites knew, that, knew they had a victory. Mm. Because it wasn't that the people of God saw the enemies of God. It was that the enemies of, of God saw the people of God under the anointing and power of God and were trembling. And so we have to remember as a church is, God has built us as an offensive vehicle. And I mean that in every sense of the word. What we say is offensive, right? But you can't, if, if you work so as to take the offense away of the gospel, you take the power away of the gospel. Mm-hmm. You take the power of the gospel away. And so, so Paul says, don't come to wise and persuasive words, but in a demonstration of the Spirit's power. We preach Christ and Christ crucified. So pivot back to Joshua, Joshua chapter five. Joshua's out on his own because leaders got to get time away, right? I don't know how you do this. Your assistant told me your schedule. It's mind numbing. Hours and hours on the radio, hours and hours doing this stuff with people you've just met. And she's like, he can absorb an insane amount of information, synthesize it in his head. And then he's, he's naturally curious, which to be honest, I, I haven't even watched much of your stuff recently, though I'm aware of your voice and grateful for it. I watched a couple of, of interviews and what hit me about you is that you are insatiably curious. And I love that because that's a measure of humility. It's like, I don't know everything. I got a lot to learn. I started here. I'm moving here. I'm shifting there. Like that's contagious. And so thank you for being a curious learner. Uh, I think that's come to me as a child. Yeah. Why? Why is this this way? Why? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Once yeah. you say, I know it, you're done. It's over. It's over. But as a leader, I'm sure there's times you got to get away, shut off the noise, turn the phone off, stop watching cantankerous redneck pastors on, 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 on Instagram. <laughs> And just kind of be alone and like read the word of God. If you have a Bible, mm-hmm. listen for the spirit of God to lead and guide. And that's what Joshua is doing. And the Bible records this encounter. He says a giant man with a sword approached him. And so, so Joshua's in enemy territory, okay? Leading the people of God on the mission of God to go to battle. And Joshua's a fighter. He's a warrior. It says the text that Joshua drew his sword. And he said, which I love, Joshua wasn't like, you know, security breach come help me guys josh is like i got this i'll take care of this no no this guy's right. big and hairy this one looks fun mm-hmm. and he's, he's he's he says he says who are you are you for us or against us right you know the answer the answer said neither 
but as the general of the army of the Lord, I'm here to do business. Most theologians think that that is a, a pre-incarnate vision of Jesus, the, 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 the general of the Lord's armies. Mm. And what's so crazy is when Jesus came to Joshua, Jesus didn't say, I'm here to take sides. Jesus said, I'm here to take over. So the question isn't, am I on your team? Right politicians. The question isn't, am I on your team, progressive world radicals? The question is, are you on my team? That's the only question that matters. And as an individual, am I on his team? That's right. And so, are you for me or against me? Neither. I'm for me. And that's the repeated testament of scripture, is that God does all he does for his glory. And therein is the only reason he could love us and worthy as we are. And so the question is, are we going to get on the, the God's glory team? And, um, and if we are, then it's exciting. And, and it, it, G.K. Chesterton, that great, happy, jovial Catholic, uh, once said, um, and this would be my encouragement to, to the church in America, to pastors who are maybe discouraged, I, was, I, I would say, don't give up hope. Jesus wins. Make sure you're on his team. Don't live so as to avoid controversy. Live so as to be faithful, right? I mean, you look at the uh, Anglican bishop who said, um, I find myself deeply troubled as of late. A friend asked why. He said, because when I read the New Testament in the spirit-filled apostles of Jesus, in the spirit-filled life of the Christian, everywhere Paul went, he caused riots. And everywhere I go, they serve me tea. Mm. And there was a sense of holy conviction that, um, that I think there's something inherent in the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ that is offensive and that stirs offense. And if we're not preaching in such a way so as to stir offense, then we're probably not preaching the pure gospel because the ones that preach the gospel that are our examples, Jesus, Paul, Peter, the apostles, they all got their head cut off by a government who said, you're being too political. Because, and here's the thing, they were preaching and proclaiming, Glenn, a different kingdom. They were, they were proclaiming, like, like, like um, I was reading a, a, a friend, he said, uh, he said, I have issue with, with the phrase Christian nationalist. Mm. And, the, and my problem with the phrase is the nationalist. I'm a Christian imperialist. <laughs> there, there, there God's is, kingdom. There is an emperor, and that emperor has a body and a face and hair and hands. Mm-hmm. And that emperor's name is Jesus, and he is still in bodily form at the right hand of God, and I serve him and him alone. And to tell you, it's so funny, I'm, I happen to be wearing this today. This is uh, my personal logo. Yeah. It's the skull and crossbones. Okay. This is a prototype. It left off the crown. There's supposed to be a crown there. Okay. This is a colonial uh, huh. symbol. Yeah. And it was no king but Christ. Wow. That mortal king? That's right. No. He might have the crown, but no king but Christ. And they rejected him because he was demanding an allegiance that we can only attribute to Jesus. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Interrupt you though. But no, no, no. Did no. you make that up? Or did you have that? What is No, F- I had this made, but S- it's just. F-T- no, that's just. It's going to spiral out of control now. That's okay. sick, twisted freak, for the, which I call my audience. So, <laughs> okay. Um, but okay. Uh, okay. I just. It, they had this understanding yeah. back then. Yeah. And. Um, you don't lose your first citizenship to save your second. Amen. That's a good word. So. That's a good word. And I'll tell you, to the Christian leaders who are listening, um, people are starved for the truth. Starving. Starving. And listen to Christian nationalists because they're saying something, and yeah. it may be wrong, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're saying something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, like, like I, I don't know how you define Christian nationalists, and I'm going to get, oh my gosh, in someone's trouble, but I could tell you, like, yeah, I'm a Christian lives in a nation yes and and, and I'm, I'm for my I'm nation, pro that nation and i'm for god i think the bible calls us to be patriots yes i think every christian in every country on the planet should think they live in the best country mm. because no family gets better and stronger and happier and healthy if they think it sucks mm-hmm. and so i think personally no offense no no i'm married to the most amazing woman in the world oh yeah i take offense and, <laughs> <laughs> and i have the most remarkable kids in the world right they're smarter than yours and better mm-hmm. looking right right <laughs> Right. And, and that's the source of my family's thriving. Right. I look at my wife and kids and go, I know who I am, Glenn. And I know I have no business. 
oh, you got me thinking about my wife. I'm going to cry. Mm. I have no business being married to a woman like Sherry McPherson. But for some reason, God's grace, he said, I'm going to love my boy by giving him this girl. Now, that comes with great responsibility, right? To protect and provide and lead and love. And I feel that and I carry that and that's good for me. My, my, my buddy Mark says, men are like trucks. They, they ride better with a heavy load. And um, so I should carry that weight. And my kids, my daughter, Ella May, my son, Levi, uh, Gregory, my daughter, Amelia Claire, my son, Gideon Joshua, they are the four best human beings on the planet. They love me. They're praying, they're praying for us right now. Um, my daughter prayed for you this morning. If my daughter prays for you, it's in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Take it. I have a daughter with cerebral palsy. Same. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same. My daughter born in spina bifida yeah. in a wheelchair. Um, the what a light of our life. The yeah. light of our life. Never met a stranger. Never had a bad day. Her daily regimen takes her through more pain and trials than most grand ma- grown men go through in a month. And I've never once heard her complain. It's, her, it's, just, it's just God just filled him with her spirit. And, and she walks in that. But, same. But, uh, but I think we should think we live in the greatest nation on the planet. Not because we're arrogant or not because we're nationalists, but because God's call us to live here. And if you hate your yard, it'll never get green. Mm-hmm. You got to weed it. You got to care for it. It's going to be, you know, have weeds and, and, and you're going to be part of the problem sometimes but, too. But we're, but you want to love it to care for it so that it grows and thrives and flourishes. But we are also different in our nation um, because we have these documents yeah. um, that are the highest authority yes. in the land. And they were God inspired and yep. they they unlock the rights that allow you to read that, allow yep. you to preach yep. that. Um, Which is so important to point out because in, in the text, the, the, the document gives us authority, right? Mm-hmm. And then the Constitution says, will these truths be self evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among them life. The, the, the Constitution is acknowledging mm-hmm. that government do not give. Mm-hmm. Men rights. Mm-hmm. God gives men rights. Mm-hmm. Government was not designed to give men rights, which means government cannot take men's rights. Mm-hmm. Our government was it was was born to acknowledge sovereign rights given to man and then protect them. And our Keep insurance going. policy is yeah. the Bill of Rights. That's right. They're like, in yep. case you didn't understand the first time. Yep. Here's yep. the Bill of Rights. I interrupted you. Keep going. Yeah. I, um, uh, I don't remember what I was saying. Oh, it, was, it was amazing. Yeah. It was, it was well, gonna, let's leave it at it that then. Change if somebody's it was really, life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I interrupted you. I got to no, carry no, no. that down. No, I got to no, live no. with that. Yeah. Well, life. you live with it because yeah. I, you know, um, I can't thank you enough for coming down. Will you come again? I want to, I've, I want to talk to you about men because yeah. I know your hat says stronger man nation. Yep. There is such a a lack of understanding of men. Yes. Um, and so I'd love to talk to you about that. I'd love it. I do remember kind of what it okay. was. It is Im- it's important because we've danced around Christian nationalism. Yes. And it's really important. And I'm not even sure how people define it. So no, I know. I'm over, they my, define it, over uh, my skis here. Most people don't. They don't know. There's, like you have defined, yeah. I love my country. Right. And I love God. Right. But I have this rule book called the constitution right and they work together but we're not a country that says you have to be this religion that's right you know that's right we our government should and we should and we shouldn't be yeah right we shouldn't be yeah that's not christian nationalism yes government can't change the heart of man correct laws can't change the heart of man it can stop punishing good behavior yeah you know what yep. i mean yep um but it should not be the the ruler uh, uh the 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 measuring tape that's right of good behavior what that's does right. it know yeah the, that comes from the individual knowing who god is that's right the more a laws align with the word of god the more human flourishing yes uh, more freedoms we can about. have yes 100 percent. yeah yep. So I, I think it was, you. Is that, was that no, that's, I just wanted to say that because I yeah, think yeah. that's the page you're on yeah. and the Christian nationalism thing is um, taking root. Uh, uh, and I don't think how, how by you average def- person, def- they just don't know what the bad Christian nationalism is. Yeah, yeah. How, which, how would you define Christian nationalism? Like, like the, the most agreed upon definition of, of the phrase. I think the most agreed upon is what we just talked about. I think most people, okay. when they are, when they hear Christian nationalism, they go like, "Well, what's the problem? I love my country. I right. love, I love right. God. What, what's the problem? Black Lives Matter. 
<laughs> yes. So it, it, but it, once it's you get past psychos. the BLM right. and the little black box, you're like, right. oh, wait a minute. It means what? Right, 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 right. Exactly right. I, I think black lives matter. I happen to think all lives matter. Right. Wait, you're attacking the nuclear family? Right. Wait a minute. Exactly right. Right, right. And that's exactly this whole right. theory of containment buddy was talking about in terms of, of, of uh, if we can contain Christians by guilt by association. So, mm -hmm. for instance, it, it's like you're going to the Glenn Beck show? Yeah. Well, no. do, do you know he believes this? Or what if he believes it? I'm like, I don't know. I'm a Bible believing, spiritual dude up for a conversation with anybody who let me speak freely and talk about Jesus Amen. and see if we can move ourselves towards, uh, you know, and, and let the chips fall. And what, what I would tell pastors is like, saturate your mind with the word of God, walk in the power of the spirit of God, speak your mind, live with a clear conscience, go home, have a steak and sleep like a Calvinist on Benadryl. <laughs> right? Thank you. My last word. Can I get one more word in? Yes. GK Chesterton, that great happy Catholic said, the one great glory of walking by faith, this side of sight, you know, so our faith will one day be sight and what we see dimly through, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we'll see, behold the face of Jesus. The one great glory of living this side of sight and walking by faith is to be called of God to participate in what feels like a losing battle mm. and never lose. Because the kingdom of God advances steadily through a series of victories cleverly disguised as defeats. So brothers out there, take heart. You stick with Jesus, the general of the Lord's army going to get his business done. He's going to win. And we want to be on his team. Amen. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been an honor.